do. Well, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18 this morning, and we're going to be looking at verses 21 through 35. I'll uh, just kind of beginning in verses 20 and or 21 and 22. Now, you've got to love Peter, don't you? I mean, you do. Jesus, if you look at the context, had just spoken on church discipline and church unity. What it is that we do when our brother trespasses and how we resolve these things within the corporate body. The importance of church unity in verse number 20 where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of him. And so Jesus has just laid out grounds for church discipline and church unity. And, and Peter here, Peter is really concerned about what his responsibility is when somebody offends him. Never mind that he really doesn't seem to give any indication to the, to the fact that he could be the offender. But Peter is concerned, Lord, what is my responsibility when someone offends me? And I love Peter because Peter, in, in, in great holiness, suggests, Lord, should I forgive my brother seven times. And now, to understand this, the rabbis of the day taught that you had a responsibility as a good Jewish man or woman to forgive three times. You had a responsibility to forgive three times, and beyond three, well, then that was kind of up to you. You, you had no other obligation. So Peter, in great spirituality, says, Lord, nay, not three, but, but seven Shall I forgive my brother seven times? Now look, you only ask how many times you have to do something that you really don't like to do. You don't ask how many times do I have to do something that I enjoy. Like never once this summer did my kids ask, Dad, how many times do we have to go to Cedar Point? Never once have they asked, how many pieces of candy do I have to eat tonight? Never once have they asked, oh, how long do I have to play this video game? No, 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 we don't ask how long or how often we have to do things that, that we like or enjoy. And so in essence, Peter here, you know what Peter was doing? Peter was admitting, hey Lord, I struggle with this. This is not something that I enjoy doing. This is not something that I'm good at. Lord, I struggle with this. And you know what? It's something we struggle with too. It is something that every single soul in here this morning, every soul listening by way of radio, every soul listening by way of internet, it is something that every single one of us has struggled with. Forgiveness. Because real forgiveness is hard. It's hard. You know what, even in this moment, some of us who are struggling with bitterness and unforgiveness, some of us who are struggling with baggage and burdens, even now you are turning me off. Maybe, number one, because you don't want to forgive. I don't want to give it up. You don't know what they did to me, and I'll give it up when I get even. Some this morning are already turning me off and turning God off. Because you don't want forgiveness. Some in here are turning, turning off this morning, shutting down this morning because you don't believe it's possible anymore. You have struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled and you feel like every time you've made progress, you get pulled right back. In, in talking, it's almost, it's almost like a current. Every time you think you've swam out a little bit from the issue, you've gotten a little bit of distance, that current just sucks you right back in and you struggled with it for so long that you don't even think it's possible anymore. Real forgiveness is hard. It's hard. But I tell you, it's possible Amen. through Jesus Christ. And honestly, real forgiveness, it starts with us understanding what real forgiveness is. 
So let me give you a little bit of a working definition for us this morning. Forgiveness is a personal act of giving up or letting go the rights to resentment and retaliation. Forgiveness is this. It is the personal act of giving up or letting go the rights to resentment and retaliation. It is, it is the decision, it is the choice to not impute or not so hold someone accountable in your own right for something that has happened. And I'm going to tell you, this, this Christmas season, the greatest gift that you could receive is forgiveness. Is forgiveness. And we're going to look at that this morning in the Word of God. To answer Peter's question, Jesus, as he so often does, gives a little story. He gives a parable. Beginning in verse 23, the parable goes like this. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. You know, ladies and gentlemen, if you and I are going to be able to understand and you and I are going to be able to have true forgiveness in our lives, you know what it's going to take? Roman numeral one this morning, it's going to take the truth that I have a debt. That I have a debt. Can you say that with me this morning? I have a debt. You look at this man. In Jesus' parable, we see a servant who owed his master 10,000 talents. Now, a lot of people try to put that into today's money. And some of that is hard for us to do because uh, they used weights and measures and other things. And it's not exact. But let me give you this. The talent was the, the heaviest weight in the Jewish measurement system. 10,000 was the largest of the round numbers that was available to them. And so it was the heaviest weight of the largest round number. In other words, you're not meant to try to calculate it out. You're meant to look at it and go, whoa. That is an immeasurably large debt. But if you still need a point of reference, uh, the, the total tax levy for the entire region of Palestine in that day was 800 talents per year. 800 talents. The entire revenue of that area. They said that a man would have to work approximately 20 years in order to make one talent. That a man would have to work 20 years to make one talent. How much did this man owe? He owed 10,000 talents. This man's debt was beyond computation. There was no way he could pay it back. There was nothing he could do. And might I add, to rack up a debt like that, that doesn't happen on accident. That doesn't happen because you borrowed a 20 once or twice to put gas in the car because you were tight. That happens because inevitably there was some sort of criminal enterprise going on and this man had extorted 10,000 talents from his master. You realize this morning that you and I owe a debt so great Now, this is you and I we're talking about now, that you and I owe a debt so great that we cannot even understand it, much less pay it. You and I owe a debt to Almighty God so great that we cannot even begin to wrap our minds around it. Let me put it this way. What if you got what you deserved for everything wrong you did on this earth? 
What if every time you did wrong, you got caught and got what you deserved? Let me, let me, let me boil it down to just one thing. Speeding. What if every time you went over the speed limit, you got a ticket? Every time you did a rolling stop at a stop sign, you got a ticket. Oh, we're not talking about, all we're talking about, one little aspect of your life. What if you got everything you deserved by law just from what you do when you drive your car? How many of us would be in a whole lot of trouble? Bill Brown, the most of all, amen? <laughs> you see, when you start comparing who we are to what we deserve, to that which we have earned, you see that we are in a desperate situation. And I want you to think this, not just imagine if you were punished for everything you deserved in this world, now imagine if you got every punishment you deserved when you stand before God one day. A God who the Bible says of him in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 13, that neither is there any creature that is not manifest or open in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In other words, God sees and knows everything about you. Proverbs 15 and verse number 3 puts it this way, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Every place. Beholding the good and the evil. What if God gave you what you deserved for every deed you have ever done? What if God gave you what you deserved for every thought you had ever thought? What if God gave you what you deserved for every attitude you've ever had? What if God gave you what you deserved for every word you've ever spoken? What if God gave you what you deserved? What if God gave me what I deserved? Church, we are bankrupt before God. We are bankrupt before God. The very best that we can do, the Bible says, in comparison to God and His standard, are like filthy rags. We are bankrupt. And it's so important that we start here because whenever we talk about forgiveness, whenever we talk about forgiveness, it is imperative that we always start with the fact that I need forgiveness. I have a debt. I had a debt that I could not pay. I had a debt that I could not even wrap my brain around. I need forgiveness and the debt that this man carried led him to great desperation. The Bible says in the story here, Jesus said the man had no choice but to throw himself before his master. And he begged for patience. He begged for patience. He said, give me time. Give me time, Lord. Give me time and I'll pay you all. But if it would take him 20 years to earn one talent, how long to earn 10,000 talents? The man threw himself at the mercy of the master. He begged for patience. But the master, the Bible says, was moved with compassion. And instead of patience, he gave pardon. The servant was free. The Bible says he was loosed. He was forgiven. Forgiven. I tell you, there is no sweeter realization on earth than to know that you are forgiven. And I'm going to tell you, it's not that it didn't happen. 
It's not that you didn't do bad things and say bad things and think bad things and have bad attitudes. It's not that you were a perfect husband or perfect wife, a perfect father, a perfect mother, a perfect child, perfect student, perfect employee, perfect Christian. It's not that you were perfect and it's not that my debt didn't happen and it's not that it didn't exist, but it is that in Christ, the King no longer holds it to my account. In Jesus, by God's grace and mercy alone, I am free. I want, to, I want to encourage you this morning the whole point of Christmas is, is unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord why did he send a Savior because I needed forgiven and this morning if you still carry that debt let me ask you what's going to happen if you die with that debt what's going to happen when you stand before God and God holds you accountable for all of it you know you and I have the tremendous opportunity in this life the Bible says to come to God through Jesus Christ by His grace, not of our works. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5 puts it this way, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you this morning that you don't get to heaven. Nobody gets to heaven because they come to church. And nobody gets to heaven because they do good works. And nobody gets to heaven because they get baptized. And nobody gets to heaven because they try to be sincere. The only way any of us get to heaven the only way any of us get forgiven is the same way this servant gets forgiven is to fall down at the feet of the king and to just plead his mercy and his grace Amen. and this morning if you have never accepted God's gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ that gift is extended to you this morning would you accept it you say, preacher, but you don't know what I've done. I don't need to. What I do know is every one of us had an incalculable debt that we could never pay. But God in Christ offers forgiveness. To understand the gift of forgiveness this morning, we have to start here. We have to start with I have a debt. Can we say that again this morning, church? I have a debt. Let's say it again. I have a debt. Jesus continued the story in verse number 27 or 28. Look what Jesus said. But the same servant, this is the servant who just been forgiven 10,000 talent in debt. Then the, then, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? For his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. You know what this story teaches me? It teaches me, number one, I have a debt. I have a debt. I have a debt. Number two, it teaches me simply this. I have a decision. I have a decision. Now, there are things that come into our life that are sometimes unavoidable. 
There are things that people will say, things that people will do. Sometimes it's not even people, it's just life. Sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes life just hurts. Sometimes if we could put an adjective to it, it just stinks sometimes. It hurts. And for no reason than lucky me, congratulations, woohoo. Unavoidable circumstances. You know, what we saw is we saw the servant that had been forgiven had another servant who owed him. There was a debt that he was owed. And, and let's be honest this morning, this was not a small debt. When you look at it in light of what it was, 300 pence was about three months' wages. I'm sorry, but if you owed me three months' wages, we'd probably have words too. That's a lot of money to me. And I imagine that's probably a lot of money to most of us. Three months' wages. And, and so, being owed three months' wages, this forgiven servant decided to, to try to get what he was owed. And by the way, church, we don't know the circumstances. We don't know why this man owed the other servant. We don't know. Maybe he had borrowed the money. Maybe he had stolen the money. I don't know. Maybe his kids had snuck out one night and tipped all his sheep over. And, and, and in restoration for tipping the sheep or backing his chariot into the light pole, uh, maybe, maybe it was something like that. And he just had damages that he had to pay. We don't know exactly what was going on. But we do know this. He owed him. There was a debt. Some offense that had to be repaid. You know, the Bible teaches very clearly that offenses will come. Amen? The Bible teaches very clearly that offenses will come. And if you live this life trying to build a comfort zone instead of understanding that you're living in a combat zone, you're going to live pretty frustrated. You're going to wonder, why can't I ever just, just have a few moments or have peace? Why can't everything be okay? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a battle zone. We live in a battle zone. And we are engaged in spiritual conflict. Beyond spiritual conflict, I want you to look around you. Look around this morning. Those same people that Mr. Wyrick told you to backhandedly compliment slash offend this morning. I want you to look around at all those people around you. And I want you to remember this, this, this mathematical truth, okay? People plus personalities always equal problems. People plus personalities always equal problems. Problems. And I think to make matters worse, we live in a day of perpetual offense. Everybody is offended at everything. Can you believe what he said, he said, she said, he did, sister such and such, and brother, what do you know? And, and everybody's offended about everything. Offenses will come. I want you to look around. Look around even in this room. Offenses will come. People will say things, do things, and whether it's real or perceived, because I'm going to tell you what I have found is most of the times when I feel like I have been hurt, most of the times when I feel I have been hurt, you know the reality is, is most of the time I have just misunderstood. That's what I've found. I found most of the time the world's not out to get me. And it's not out to get you either. But offenses, when they come, whether real or perceived, produce hurt. And that's why the Bible teaches us that we have got to live so carefully. We have got to watch this thing of forgiveness so closely. Look, if you would, at Hebrews chapter number 12, beginning in verse number 14. The Bible says this, Follow peace, pursue peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently... Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. The Bible teaches that we have got to live purposefully, peacefully with all men. Do what we can to avoid being offended. 
In other words, can I put it this way? We have got to be so careful that we don't let what we can't control take control. We've got to be so careful that we don't let what we can't control take control. Because you see, for every unavoidable circumstance, there is always an undeniable choice. You cannot control what life hands you, but you do control what you do with it once it's in your hands. I'm going to tell you, this servant, this servant who had been forgiven, he heard the exact same plea that he had offered the master. This servant who had been forgiven could have extended the exact same gift that he had been given. He had a choice, and so do I, and so do you. Your response to the wrong will make all the difference. And understand with me this morning, because this is, this is counterintuitive, and it goes against what our culture lives. But to suffer an offense is an event. It is something that happens. To suffer an offense is an event. To live offended is a choice. To suffer an event, for someone to say something, do something, attack, malign, lie, undercut, whatever it may be. And I don't mean to belittle your, your hurt this morning. Some of you have suffered hurt in ways that I cannot even begin to imagine. But to suffer an offense is an event. It is something that happened to you. To live offended is a choice. That you make. And I already hear the objections. Well how can I forgive if they won't? I mean it takes two to forgive after all. Okay I'll give you that. Forgiveness does take two. It takes you and God. It takes you and God. In essence this is what forgiveness is. Is I am a man that what? I have a debt. My debt has been forgiven. My master, my king, has forgiven me all of my debt. And so when I look out at people who have offended me, who have a debt to me, when I forgive, you know what I'm doing? I am making the decision to release, to give up, to let go of the offense to God. In other words, I am relinquishing my right to find restitution. I am releasing my right to find retribution. I am releasing that right to the one to whom it really belongs anyways. I release it to God. Forgiveness is just that. It is a release, a giving up, or a letting go of an offense to God. It is letting go of the right to hold on to it, understanding that it doesn't belong to me. Now, church, don't confuse forgiveness with reconciliation or restoration. Restoration or reconciliation involves the two parties coming back together. Restoration involves a, a trust that is, that is rebuilt into that relationship. But forgiveness does not automatically bring reconciliation or restoration. Now, for, for instance, since we're on money this morning, if Pastor Belcher had embezzled $10,000 from me, I would wonder where in the world he got it from. <laughs> Number one... I would say, brother, I'm pretty sure you robbed somebody else because there's no way you got that from me. But you know what? If Pastor Belcher stole my credit card and he racked up thousands and thousands of dollars worth of charges and he came back and 
He said, well, brother, I'm so sorry, and I'm just broken over this, and I did wrong. Do you know what? That would be some reconciliation between us. And by the way, biblically, we don't have time to go into it, but I have the responsibility to reconcile with my brother when he comes to me. I do. You know, the, act, the idea of full restoration is going to take time. In other words, we might be reconciled, but that doesn't mean I'm going to ask him to hold my wallet. Amen? I mean, let's not confuse our terms. Sometimes we think, well, I can't forgive because they don't think they've done wrong or they don't care or they're happy they hurt me. Well, forgiveness ultimately isn't about you and them. It's about you and God. And why you are holding on to something that belongs to Him. God's people are not victims of their circumstances. Oh, if we could get that down. No matter what happens to us, the deepest hurt, the most horrific loss, God's people are not victims of their circumstances. Biblically, we are victors of the cross. Victors, we, uh, biblically, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Biblically, we see in, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 that there's no temptation or trial that's taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation or test also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. This servant didn't have to get locked up. This servant didn't have to go to the tormentors. This servant didn't have to end up that way. He did though because he was okay with being forgiven but not being forgiving. And therefore he lived a miserable life. And I will note here as Jesus so vividly described as this servant was delivered to the tormentors. Unforgiveness brings deep abiding pain. And in an effort to extract payment from another, an effort to hold on to a hurt or hold on to a loss, you end up imprisoning yourself. There is little that compares to the torment of unforgiveness. And the only way to be free is to be forgiven. The gift of forgiveness. It starts by understanding what, church? That I have a debt. It continues by understanding that I have a decision. I am not the victim of my circumstance. I have a decision. I want to go all the way back to the beginning to what Jesus told old pious Pete. Lord, shall I forgive seven times? And Jesus said in verse number 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times. Seven. Not only do I have a debt, and not only do I have a decision, if I am a child of God, if I am a born-again believer, I have a directive. I have a directive. For the Christian this morning, there is no debate. There is no discussion. The Christian is to forgive. The Christian is not to hold on to hurts. The Christian is not to harbor hurts. The Christian is to release those hurts to God. He is judge. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And that's good enough for me. It's not for me to hold on to. He says, casting all your cares upon Him. For He careth for you. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Understand this. For the Christian there is no discussion. For the Christian there is no debate. Our directive is to forgive. Period. You see our example? 
You see our example this morning? And I thought if only we had an example. If only we as believers had someone we could look to who had every right to be offended, had every right to be distant, had every right to build up walls, had every right to close people out, had every right to walk away, but chose to forgive. If only we had an example of someone who did that. Oh yeah, we do. The Bible says of Jesus in 1 Peter chapter number 2, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. You look back at Jesus on the cross of Calvary. All that he went through, did he deserve it? Had he done anything to earn it? Yet like a sheep to the slaughter, the Bible says he went. When reviled, reviled not again. When he was threatened, when he suffered, he threatened not. He committed himself to him that judges righteously. You'll see this Luke chapter 23 and verse number 34 when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. What did he do? He took all of the wrongs that he had suffered, all of the beatings that he had suffered, all of the maligning and the threatening and the, the whipping. He took all of it and what did he do? He, what did he do? He released it to his father. He forgave as an example to us. And I'm going to tell you, nothing other than Christ is our model. He's our empowerment as well. You see, we can't. We can't. I, I, I suffer wrong, or I even see other people. Sometimes that's even harder, isn't it? To see other people suffer wrong. People we know. People we love. To see other people. And sometimes I pick up on their wrongs. And you know what? I want to hold it for them. And sometimes the wrong is just so grievous. That I don't feel like I can. I don't feel like I can. Sometimes I've held on to it for so long. That it feels like a part of my identity. I don't feel like I can. We can't. But he can. And that's the, that's the gift of forgiveness this morning. That His grace is not just designed to come to you, but His grace is designed to flow through you. I think of the example of that sinner at Corinth, or the saint at Corinth who had committed the sin, the gross sin of immorality with his stepmother. And if you look at 1 Corinthians, Paul admonished them to exact church discipline upon him and, and that, that he might recognize his sin and get right with God. We come to 2 Corinthians, and we see that that has happened, that this man has recognized his sin, he's repented, he's, he's gotten right with God, and he desires to come back into the fellowship. And we'll tell you, if I were Paul, I would struggle with this. Paul was a man who was zealous for Jesus. You could do anything to Paul, but he was zealous for Jesus. But I want you to notice how Paul instructs this church about how to handle this man who had committed this gross sin against God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 10, Paul wrote this, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the what? In the person of Christ. Paul says it's in the person of Christ. It's through Christ that we can forgive. And it doesn't matter the wrong. It doesn't matter the hurt. Verse 11, look at that. The Bible says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, you are indwelt by the Spirit of God. 
If you're a Christian this morning, you are empowered by the Spirit of God. You're here, you're a Christian this morning. The Bible says you are interceded for by the very Son of God. You're a Christian this morning, you have access to the very throne of God. And the Bible says that you and I who know the Lord have a great high priest who understands. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15 puts it this way. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted, to be tested, to be hurt, to be lied about, to be mocked, to be beaten, to be mistreated. Jesus knows. And we have a high priest, the Bible says, who knows. We have a high priest, the Bible says, who will deal with the wrong. What you and I have to do is come to the recognition that he, our high priest, is enough. That he's enough. But, 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 Pastor, how will people know that I have been wrong? People don't need to know that you have been wrong. Believe it or not, it doesn't have to go on Facebook. Like, I know that's super hard to believe. But it doesn't have to. Like, you can, as a believer, you can actually process and deal with these things without going to Facebook. Without going to your friends. By just going to God. By coming to the realization that He is enough. Verse 15 talked about He is our great high priest. Verse 16 admonishes us this. Let us therefore, because we have this great high priest, who knows, who understands, who can deal with it, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'll tell you this morning, forgiveness doesn't mean that we have the power to make it right. It doesn't. It might never be right on this side of heaven. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we have the power to make the pain go away. It might hurt and continue to hurt for some time. It doesn't mean that we will forget. By the way, that is the dumbest thing in the world. That when you truly forgive, you will forget. We, we don't forget, how many of us forget big moments of our life? Moments that move or shape us. And we don't, it's the dumbest thing ever. Don't, so many people struggle with guilt because dumb people say dumb things. It doesn't mean that you're going to forget. It doesn't mean that you won't struggle tomorrow. But you know what forgiveness through Jesus Christ does mean? It does mean that we have the power to lay down our right to prosecute. That we have the power to let go and to give up our right to retribution. That we have the power to release it to God and not to carry the responsibility for that hurt or that wrong anymore. We won't carry it anymore because it belongs to Him. That is our directive. Because it belongs to him. Peter asked for a measuring rod. Boy, measuring rods are easy. Give me a checklist any day. I love me some lists. Jesus said, forget the ruler. Just forgive. I'm going to tell you the greatest gift that you could receive this Christmas is forgiveness. Some of you this morning have never accepted God's forgiveness of your sins. Some of you this morning have never accepted, accepted God's gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is all about. And I'm going to tell you no piece of jewelry, no Xbox, no PlayStation, none of that. No new car. I mean, I mean, you could get yourself a new Lexus or even a Peloton. Apparently that's a big thing. You could get yourself one of them. And I'm going to tell you, there's no gift like the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'm going to tell you this, there's no greater time than today, this 
moment to accept God's gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Some of us this morning have been carrying baggage for a long time that doesn't belong to us. Oh, may, it may have happened to you. I'm sure it did. But if you're a Christian here this morning, it doesn't belong to you. It doesn't. You've tossed and turned. You've suffered anger and depression. You have felt helpless. You have felt hopeless. It's time to let it go. I'm going to tell you, some of us this morning need to take that offense and forgive. And when I say forgive, I don't mean that that relationship with the other person is made whole. I don't mean that, that all of that trust has been rebuilt. I mean that when we forgive, we take that offense and we release it. We lay it down at the feet of Jesus because it's His anyways. We recognize that the right of retribution doesn't belong to me. And when you release your right to retribution, you release yourself. It's not that it didn't happen. It's not that it doesn't hurt. It's not that you will forget. But it is by God's grace that you get to move forward. Amen. The gift of forgiveness. I don't know your situation, but here's the Bible. Number one, church, I have a debt. Number two, Number three, what are we going to do with God's gift of forgiveness? Would you stand with me this morning, heads bowed and eyes closed as the musicians are coming?